Please open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Now I'm pretty sure that all of you have forgotten what I preached. It was a long time ago. And actually, I preached on Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son last time. Today, I'm going to focus on the first two parables, the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost son. Um, many, many years ago, I've been married for, oh, thank goodness my wife is not here, I think 13 years now. And, you know, we were in, at graduate school doing our uh, Master's in Divinity at uh, Southwestern Seminary in Texas. And I remember my pastor had told me, Peter, first two years, just focus on studying God's Word, getting your theology down. Then about third year, pray that God will send you a spouse. And then it will be wonderful if your spouse can you know, do your last year of seminary with you so she can see and be around your seminary friends because they're going to be your lifelong friends and also that she can study God's word together. And I remember his last word to me was, make sure that you pick the right girl. And because if you're going to go into ministry, although I knew that I'm not like Pastor Paul, I've always known that I would not go into a pastoral ministry. Because I know that if I'm a pastor, I know I would die and the congregation would die right along with me. So my calling is not pastoral. Um, but having said that, I remember just thinking, wow, I really need to marry the right girl who's going to really support me in the ministry that God has called me to do. And so I was a little concerned. And then I remember my third year came along and my antennas went up. And I was in search of my wife, my lifelong mate. And just looking and wondering, Lord, is she the one? Is she the one? Then one day, um, I was serving at Korean First Baptist Church of Dallas. One day, this lady came in. I've never seen her before because I know all the young adults. And she came in uh, to our English service. And I remember standing up on the pulpit, and she came in, and my eyes just kind of locked. And... It was not love at first sight, because I don't believe in love at first sight, but it was more of infatuation. You know, she was very beautiful in my eyes, although I had no idea who she was. And so as I was preaching, I was kind of looking at her at times and thinking, Lord, maybe she is the one. Lord, I think you sent the right one to me. And so I remember she was only here for a week, I found out, uh, visiting her friend. And then we got to meet, and we kind of hit it off uh, right away. And I remember after I met, um, maybe about a month later, I um, flew out to Maryland and to meet uh, her side of the family. It was pretty quick. And um, some of the singles here, let me kind of share a, a little, um, yeah, a little advice. This one's for free. I remember my um, two things. I remember my pastor told me, okay, if you really want to know, okay, uh, the person that you're marrying, if you really want to know what he or she is all about. Because, you know, when you first date, you put forth your very best. You know, I remember uh, when we were dating, my wife would never eat. But now she eats more than I do. And But at the very beginning when you're dating, you know, you don't want to look like a pig. And, you know, you put on your best clothes and so forth. But my pastor would tell me, you got to go to her territory. And you got to see what she's like in her surrounding. Not that I'm so perfect and, you know, uh, but you got to go and see her, her, her real self with her real friends. And then you'll really get to know who she, what she's all about. And so I remember flying out there, meeting her friends and so forth. And another thing was, you know, the Korean connection. It's so dangerous. You know, every Korean's connected, especially back in the U.S. I remember, I'm a mama's boy. And so when I met Helen, I remember calling my mom. I said, Mama, I think I met this one girl, and she's from Maryland, uh, so-and-so. And then I remember about 15 minutes later, my mom had called everyone that she knew in Maryland. And then she came right back. She goes, well, she's from this, she's so-and-so from this family, and her dad's a, a, a deacon, an elder, and so forth. In other words, my mom was saying, go for it. She's the one. <laughs> and so I remember having my mom confirming the fact that, hey, it's okay. She might be the one, then pursue. 
And um, so we went on a long distance relationship for about a year and then we got married. And as you know, that we really didn't know each other. We were only courting long distance from Texas to Washington, D.C. for about a period of year, just mainly through a lot of phone calls. And then we got married. I remember right before we got married, I was in Maryland, and I was in her home and staying at her house in the guest room. And one morning, her mom had called her down, and I shouldn't have done this, I know. And, but uh, I was really curious about my wife because I was about to marry her. I really didn't know who she was still. And I was still really nervous, the fact that um, my pastor was sharing that, hey, you got to marry the right person and so forth. And I still didn't know who she was. I remember sitting down thinking, man, we're about to hook up and about to be married for life. And I really don't know her very well, I don't think. And so her mom had called her down. And I remember kind of going through her room. I don't know what I was doing, but just kind of looking around and looking at her friends and her pictures and so forth. And I was in the corner of my eyes in her closet. I saw, yes, I was going through her closet. I don't know why, but she had a stack of, I'm talking literally stack of diaries that she has written since she was seven years old. Stack of diaries. And I was thinking, no, I shouldn't. No, no, yes. So I started looking through, reading through her diaries. And just looking and reading and so forth and uh, some funny stories. And, uh, and so I didn't have very much time, maybe about 10 minutes. And so that was that. And then I was kind of looking through her clothes. And then I remember came across this one, well, actually two items. One was what in America what we call Daisy Dukes. And what Daisy Dukes are these little sh blue jean shorts, really short shorts that really come right up to your behind, okay? And something that no pastor's wife should wear at seminary or church. And I looked at that shorts and go, oh my God, those shorts are awfully short. And then I was kind of looking through her, I saw this one t-shirt, I guess you can call it a t-shirt, but it was a cutoff t-shirt that kind of came about here that shows your belly and things. And on the shirt, it says, princess. I was thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I'm not sure, and I was getting really nervous, and then we got married. Then I found out later on that those were her shorts, and she never throws anything away till this day. So those are shorts and t-shirts from, you know, when she was in fourth and fifth grade or so. And uh, then we got married, and everything was all good. But one thing I realized is this, is that, you know, I didn't know my wife at all. After many years, I would say about, after our third or fourth year in marriage, I think I finally understood who she really was. Before we got married, even first year into our uh, marriage, I remember thinking, I really didn't know who she was. And I was really concerned about a lot of things, wondering how everything was going to work out. But after being married to her, I realized that she's a wonderful a woman of prayer, faithful woman of God. And I had nothing to worry about. Now, why am I sharing this story? Look with me in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law murdered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let me ask you a very important question. What is one of the most important spiritual truths. What is one of the most important spiritual truths? Some of you might say, hey, maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's studying God's word. Maybe it's attending church. Maybe it's the missions work. Maybe it's evangelism. But I believe one of the most important spiritual truths is knowing God. And not just knowing God, but knowing God. God correctly. Do you know God correctly? When I first met my wife, I knew my wife, but I didn't know my wife correctly. And so our relationship was built upon just false ideas, and I was really worried for no reason. And once I got to know my wife for who she was, 
our marriage began to take off, that we were able to really come together as one. But it wasn't where it should be for the first two, three years because I really misunderstood my wife and her heart and what she was all about. Same thing with God. Many of you guys know God. Many of you guys are seeking God. But do you know God correctly? If you look at this passage, it says tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law. So you see the tax collectors and the Pharisees, two opposite ends of the spectrum, drawn to Jesus. Okay, you got to remember, in this time, in first century, the tax collectors were the low lives of the society. Everyone hated the tax collectors. Kind of like the IRS back in the U.S. Because here's what would happen. When the Roman government would conquer a territory, what they would do is hire a regional tax collectors. And they would bid for that position. And so once a tax collector has been hired, the tax collector can collect as many as much as money as he would like. And he gives a lot of sum to the Roman government, then he will pocket the rest. And so the people just hated the tax collectors. They were very shrewd people. And then the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders, so-called the spiritual leaders. Did you know if a Pharisee saw you pulling out a hair on a Sunday, they would say, you sinner, how dare you? If a sinner, if a Pharisee was coming to church and he would see someone who was hurt on the side of the road, Pharisees would believe, hey, you dare not work at a church on, on Sunday, on a day of the Sabbath. No, you don't help anyone. You go to church and you worship God. And so you see this legalistic, religious leaders, pious leaders on one spectrum, and the tax collectors who are drawn to Jesus. Why? Because they both knew of God. Okay, the tax collectors saw Pharisees as a representation of, of who Yahweh God was. And the Pharisees condemned the tax collectors, you sinners, don't you dare come into this house of God. So the tax collectors, although they were wealthy, they were spiritually bankrupt. They felt that they were sinners. They felt that, man, I shouldn't dare go near a church because I missed the mark. I, they were so filled with so much guilt. And the Pharisees missed the mark because they were all about legal, legalism. In a church and God, on a Sunday you go to church, you can't, put, you can't do work. They were all about, hey, look at me. I fast, I give money, 20%. Look at me. I am a faithful man of God. But when Jesus came and preached the good news, preached the grace of God, the love of God, Pharisees came together and said, he's preaching something different. So they were drawn to Jesus. The tax collectors were drawn to Jesus because the religious leaders at the time were condemning him, but all of a sudden, Jesus was reaching out to them. saying, I love you and God loves you. So for the first time, tax collectors were able to come to a religious leader and say, man, there is a different God. God does love me. Who is this God? So, they, so we know that they were drawn. Then all of a sudden, Jesus gathers them together and he tells them this parable, three parables. First one is this. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So, the story is very simple. We all know, we've heard this story many hundreds of times. So, it's plus and minus, 100 sheep, one got lost, left the 99 behind, and the good shepherd went after that one lost sheep. You ever wonder, how did this one sheep get lost? It might be where he felt like, oh, maybe the grass is greener on the other side. It's always this, human nature. So maybe he got tired of the shepherd. Maybe he got tired and wanted to, hey, I'm just going to mosey along and just get away from my shepherd and do my own thing. 
I think we do that at times as Christians. Sometimes we're under God's love, under God's grace. But for some reason, we fall away from the loving God. And we slide backwards. And where is your relationship with God today? And I just want you to know that God loves all of you so much. Uh, Ms. Choi gave a wonderful testimony today about her brother who was lost and came to know the Lord after many years. What a wonderful testimony that is. So we see this one sheep got lost for some reason. Maybe it was his willful choice. I don't know. We don't know why the sheep got lost. But he made a choice to run away from his sheep, his shepherd, and he got lost. So one day, you see the shepherd counting. It's time to go home. One, two, three, ninety-nine, and oh, he's not there. So he's counting again. All of a sudden, the one sheep got lost. So the scripture tells us a good shepherd left the ninety-nine behind, just left it in the field. And he went after that one lost sheep. The most important part in the scripture is until he found it. Until is a key word. Meaning it was a relentless pursuit after that one lost sheep until he found it. Meaning it didn't matter if it will take a day or a week or a month. The good shepherd is seeking after that one lost sheep. So the scriptures tells us, finally the good shepherd found this lost sheep. Maybe it took a few days. Maybe it took a week. I don't know. But I don't know about you. I remember about a month ago, uh, we went to Everland. And I told my two boys, I said, stay with me. It's really, really crowded. Lucas makes you, he likes to kind of run around. And so I said, Lucas, make sure you stay with me. So he kind of got uh, just... I briefly lost him for about two seconds. I remember he was like, I don't know, just right around the crowd. So, so I grabbed Lucas. Lucas, stay with Daddy. It's very important, you know, and there's a lot of people here. I don't want you to get lost. And so Toby had my little one, the six-year-old, um, his t shoes was untied. So I bent down, tied his shoes, and I looked around. Lucas was gone. And I looked everywhere. He was gone, nowhere to be found. And my heart just sank. And it's my fault, of course. So I began to panic. I mean, this is Everland, thousands of people, and there's nowhere to be found. And I'm backtracking. And I remember telling Toby, I mean, Toby's six years old. Give me a break. And I'm like, Toby, stay here. And he's like, what? Stay where? I'm like, just here. Stay here. And I'm running and looking after Lucas. And about five minutes later, I corner of my eyes, I see this little boy with tears in his eyes, and, so, and he, our eyes locked, and I ran to him, I gave my boy Lucas the biggest hug, and I said, oh, thank goodness, I found you, and he, what happened was, he saw someone that looked like me, had the same color of pants and shirt, and he followed this wrong dad, and so after I gave him a big hug, and I remember anger just kind of came over me, and I remember grabbing Lucas, and said, Lucas, how many times will I have to tell you, stay close to daddy? And I was really angry. And I remember just kind of grabbing by his hand and just kind of trying to find Toby. And we found Toby. But you know what? I'm not the good shepherd like the scripture tells us. But the good, good shepherd in the scripture here describes that when he found this lost sheep, can you imagine this good shepherd searching and searching and searching endlessly, tirelessly, finally found this one sheep on the side of a hill, probably drinking some water, having a good old time. Finally found this sheep. And the good shepherd looks at the sheep and doesn't give him a good kick in the rear end. But the scripture says he literally picks it up, puts it on his shoulder. No, he doesn't kick it all the way home, but he puts it on his shoulder, he dances all the way home. And not only that, but when he got home, he calls all his friends and say, celebrate with me. This one lost sheep that was lost, now is found. How awesome is that? I wonder what the little sheep was thinking. 
When the good shepherd finally came, he knew he put him into a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache. All of a sudden, the good shepherd puts him on the show. He's thinking, what is he going to do? Is he going to take me and cook me or what? What is he going to do? But he's dancing. So why is he dancing? Then he goes home. He calls all his friends and they're celebrating. I wonder what the sheep was thinking. Second parable. Well, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not lie to a lamb, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus tells a parable of the lost coin. But if you look at the New American Standard Bible version, it doesn't say coin, but it says drachma. What is a drachma? Drachma is a very pretty Roman coin. And what in the Jewish custom, in Jewish culture, what Jewish women would do from their birth, their grandmothers and mothers, as soon as they would come across this drachma, it's a very rare coin. It's kind of like a buffalo head penny in the U.S. or a half dollar. You don't see that. Or a two-dollar bill or so. It's a very precious, precious coin. And so what Jewish women would do as a family when they would collect Ten of them, they would put it, make it into a necklace, and she would wear it as a sign of a hopeful marriage. So you guys got to understand, it wasn't just some coin. Some lady lost her coin, and some cheap lady who lost her coin and she's looking for her money. No, it was this Jewish woman who lost her precious drachma coin. So she's searching the whole house. Then finally... After a whole day looking and looking and looking everywhere, she came across the coin. So it doesn't make sense. She lost the money. She found the coin. But she spends more money to call all her friends and celebrate. My drachma was lost. Let's celebrate. I found it. Let me ask you, how do you suppose that this coin got lost? Did it have legs like a sheep and got lost on its willful self? No. Uncontrollable circumstances. Meaning, for myself, I was born into a Buddhist family here in Korea. I never knew the Lord, never heard the gospel until way later in life. We have many friends, many people all over the world who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, who have never heard the good news. Uncontrollable circumstances. That's why it's so important for us to share the good news with others. So we see the two parables here, the sheep and the coin. We see that Jesus was drawing the Pharisees and the tax collectors. They were wondering, who is this Jesus? He is preaching something way different than what I've ever heard before. Preaching grace, God's love. God's heart. Do you know God? I think most of you do. But do you know God correctly? Let me finish with this one last story. My dad, at the age of 10, he had to run away in the streets of Korea. And forgive me of my Korean, I'm not sure, but I think it's called Tumok. But a long time ago, my dad joined a Korean gang, very famous Korean gang. And I remember seeing pictures of him with dark Ray-Ban glasses, shiny suit with cigarettes and all his friends and so forth. And I remember when I was really, really young, I could vaguely remember that we were really rich. And because my dad was um, in his gang, had set up one of the first gambling sites in Seoul. And so we had lots of money. And this was during the Imperial Japanese Army and during, during that time, you know, as far as I know, during the occupation time, right afterwards. And so I remember one day, my dad had um, embezzled money, stolen money, in other words, about, from what I hear, about a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. Back then, now it's probably worth about at least two to three million dollars. So he stole huge chunk of money from his friends and he ran away to America 
and he was living off of those boats, cruise ships, and so we're hiding out. So I remember when I was young, these guys, gangs would come and break down our door and they're looking for my dad and money, and we didn't have any. But my dad was just, you know, ran away in fear of his life. And so we lived in that kind of situation. My mom came from a very prestigious family where my grandfather was one of the first minister of education. And so the Korean government was hiding him in caves in fear of the Japanese imperial army killing all the intellectuals at that time. And so you see this beauty, my mom who comes from this, this well-to-do family and met my dad, the beauty and the beast as I call it, right? And they kind of met, and my mom was kind of into the bad boy type of thing. And so they kind of hooked up, and they got married. But my dad was used to the fast life. He was drinking a lot. He was an alcoholic. And I remember when I was little, even smelling something funny coming out of the living room. He was smoking marijuana, and he was a savvy businessman. But he knows how to spend that money, too. And so there was a lot of junk that was going on in my house. So I remember growing up thinking to myself, you know, uh, not knowing any better, but I really didn't respect my dad. I, I think I had a deeply embedded just uh, hatred towards my father. I didn't know it, but it was there. And he was a typical Korean father. I'm, I, please forgive me for generalizing, but not all Korean fathers are like this. But he was typically emotionally just not connected with us. He was always working a lot. So I really didn't know my dad very well. But he was an alcoholic. You know, he was working all the time. So I didn't know my dad very much. So there was that something as I was growing up. Even after I accepted Christ, there was something in me that just, outwardly I was respectful to my dad. I was a good son. But inwardly I just hated him. Just really didn't like him. For he was very abusive in many ways to my mom at times, verbally abusive, alcoholic, and just didn't like my dad. And then several years back, my mom sat me down and shared the story about my dad's background, about his life his difficulties. And I began to empathize and sympathize towards my dad. Finally began to understand I was mature enough, old enough to really say to myself, man, my dad went through a lot. At the age of 10, at the age of 10, he ran away. Actually, he didn't run away. My grandmother remarried because his father had run away to Japan. He was an entertainer at that time. And when my grandmother remarried, and back then in the 40s, you know, when you remarried, it's just a taboo type of thing. And so his stepfather pretty much abandoned him, said, you're not my son, get out of the house. So at a young age, my dad, at the age of 10, ran away to the streets of Seoul, eating grass, eating food, wherever he could find. And finally, he just had to join a gang, just purely survival. And he began to empathize. This wasn't my dad's choice. And so I began to pray and asking God, God, help me to have a heart for my dad. Once again, did I know God? Did I know my dad? Yes, he was my father, but I did not know him correctly. So for over 30 plus years, I had this deeply embedded hatred and anger, dissension towards my dad. Then finally, I gained the correct knowledge. Understanding my father for the first time correctly, I finally understood, aha. That's what happened to my dad. I began to empathize, to gain the whole picture of what my dad was all about. And I began a new relationship with my father, understanding him correctly. So, I want to ask all of you, you come to church, you're involved in Bible studies, some of you guys are seeking, some of you guys have been going to church all your life, do you know God correctly? God is describing himself 
as a good shepherd. Although you might fall away, you heard uh, Miss Choi today talked about that in her seminary years that she felt like God abandoned her, that she felt alone at times. And I think we could all empathize, sympathize with her. But once you know God correctly, we know that God never abandons us. Sometimes God is silent, but God is here with us at all times. That he is a good shepherd that seeks after that lost sheep until he finds you. There are many of you that are seeking God that have, ex have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to know that God is relentlessly pursuing you. And he will never force himself upon you. But is waiting for the day for you to open your heart and say, Jesus, I trust you and I believe you as my son. There are many of you here that are here at church. But your relationship with God has been growing cold. And that somewhere down the line, you've grown apart from the Lord. Maybe you remember the days when you were walking with God. The day when you accepted Jesus Christ. When you felt God's presence and His love. But for some reason, this day is no longer there. But I want you to know that God is a good shepherd. God is a tenacious woman who will never forsake you, will never leave you, will seek you with all his heart, with all his might, until he finds you. Never-ending pursuit of God's love for his people. He loves you so much. If you were the only one on this earth, the only one, Augustine, a famous theologian, says that God would still sin his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross just for you. That's the kind of love. That is the kingdom of God. The unconditional love of God. He loves you. So what is our response to him? What should be our response to this unconditional loving God? He doesn't expect us to be perfect. But he just wants you to just know who he is. Just respond naturally to this perfect love of God. To just pursue him with the best that we can. God doesn't expect perfection. He just wants you to know that he loves you. He loves you. Let's pray.